Have you ever sat and stared up at the stars and wondered, where did we come from? Let's take a journey like no other, not to a place, but to a time. Join us as we delve deep into the human past and explore our shared human origins. Welcome to the world of paleoanthropology. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the world of paleoanthropology. Today, we are doing something very special that we have been waiting uh, almost half a year for, I'd say, at this point. Something very exciting, and that is, of course, our Neanderthal Symposium, which we have very special and esteemed guests for. In order, I'd like to introduce them as Dr. Chris Stringer, Dr. Tom Hyam, and Dr. Rebecca Rag Sykes. We are very honored to have all three of you here with us. Is there anything any of you would like to introduce yourselves as before we begin? I'm a paleoanthropologist at the Natural History <laughs> Museum in London. Uh, here we are, that's me. Uh, those two professors, I'm not. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I'm at Liverpool, so I, I'm an archaeologist um, and also sort of saved into more the world of writing at the moment. And um, yeah, I'm Tom Hyam, and my specialist, I feel like I'm just on University Challenge there, my specialist <laughs> subject is, <laughs> my, 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 expert, my area of expertise is chronometry and chronology and dating things, and uh, for, for 20 years I was at the University of Oxford working in the radiocarbon accelerator unit there, um, since August last year I've come to the University of Vienna where I'm in the Department of Evolutionary Anthropology, I'm kind of following my areas of more specific interest, which is to do with um, more ancient uh, periods and more ancient times. So as you can all tell, we've got some very exciting people. And again, I, I don't know how honestly I got them all to agree to this. I promise it was willingly. <laughs> now, <laughs> now to begin, we are of course going to be discussing Neanderthals. So I want everyone to keep that in mind when they're viewing this. This is not a general paleoanthropology video. We are focusing specifically on a single group of peoples known as the Neanderthals. To kick us off, we are each going to, well, not each of us, the three of them are going to be going through a around 10 minute presentation. And then we're going to have a Q&A session of pre-picked questions that you guys submitted after. To kick us off, we'll have Dr. Springer begin. Thanks, Seth. Okay, let's see if the share screen will work. Okay, now, can you see that yet? Yes. Okay, let's try and get on to the first slide. Let me see. Okay, we better get back to the beginning somehow. No, that's the end. Okay, now the problem is my uh, little windows of people is blocking my access to the, uh, yeah, okay, let's try and shift that around. Get on to the first slide. Okay, <laughs> here we are. Um, yeah, so um, Neanderthals seem to be always in the news. And uh, here's just a selection of, of papers about Neanderthals, uh, their biology and their behavior, uh, their DNA from the last couple of years. So a hell of a lot of stories about Neanderthals coming out and it, it is really difficult even for the professionals to keep up to date with all this stuff. And we'll be talking about some of these things, no doubt in, in the next uh, hour or so. So first of all, something which I'm sure Tom and Becky will come back to is that the Neanderthals constantly in a sense have had a, a changing image through time right from the beginning uh, of the discoveries in the 1800s there were different views very different views about the Neanderthals and how they related to us um, and of course the story in terms of Neanderthals begins with this fossil bottom left there from the Neander Valley in Germany um, uncovered in 1856 and there had been two earlier discoveries of Neanderthals we now know from Gibraltar and from Angers in Belgium but those did not get the attention that this skeleton from the Neander Valley got and so Neander Valley Neanderthal and it was named as a new species of human by William King in 1864 Homo Neanderthalensis and so although the first finds came from uh, from Western Europe um, 
the Neanderthal range we know now extends much more widely across the Middle East, Western Asia, and through even into places like Siberia. So they were not just European people. And on the top right there, we can see a reconstruction of Neanderthals from 1909, uh, where there were none of the very early fossils from Africa that we now know about that showed the early stages of human evolution. And some people push the Neanderthals into this position of being a sort of missing link. A Neanderthal depicted here as very hairy, bent knees, grasping big toes, head hung forward, uh, extremely uh, ape-like really. And of course, the Neanderthals were not like that. They were fully human. Uh, their brains were as large as ours, sometimes even larger than the modern average. Um, they walked upright as well as we do. Um, and we've got this different contrasting reconstruction bottom right there from our exhibition in London done by the Kennis brothers. And you can see the Neanderthal here depicted as very human. Um, and the Kennis brothers told me that they, they based this uh, facial expression on a photograph they'd seen of Sean Connery. So there we are, the, the Neanderthals are, as very human. Um, but in fact, in evolutionary terms, they and I uh, they and us come very late in the human evolutionary story. So this is again from our exhibition in London. And we think human evolution stretches back probably 7 million years to our common ancestor with the ancestors of, of modern chimpanzees. And for the first 5 million years or so, human evolution, as far as we know, proceeded only in Africa. And then in the last 2 million years, humans emerge from Africa and start to spread to other regions. And we and the Neanderthals come very late in the story, um, certainly well within the last one million years. So this is uh, just my rep latest representation of, of some of this diversity in the last one million years of human evolution. So these different bars represent different lineages. I would call many of them different species of human. So a lot of diversity there. And even in the last couple of hundred thousand years, a number of different lineages there, including us, and the Neanderthals. And in terms of Neanderthal evolution, we can take it back to probably at least 430,000 years ago with these fantastic sets of fossils from the Cima de Huesos, the pit of the bones uh, at Atapuerca in Spain. And they're deep in a cave system. There's a blind chamber, the pit of the bones, and over 6,000. Uh, human fossils have been discovered from there, representing probably 29 individuals. Um, every part of the skeleton is represented. You can assemble them into composite skeletons. And what's interesting is that when you look at the morphology of these skeletons, they show many Neanderthal features, particularly in things like the teeth. Um, so I regard these as being primitive Neanderthals, very early members of the Neanderthal lineage, more than 400,000 years old. And that's been confirmed now from DNA work. So a femur fragment from the uh, Cima de los Huesos has produced uh, some parts of the uh, a genome, which shows that this lineage is related to the Neanderthals. So these are morphologically and genetically, uh, they can be regarded as early members of the Neanderthal lineage, even though they're more than 400,000 years old. So we can build up a sort of picture represented very simply here of a Neanderthal lineage evolving in Europe and Asia over several hundred thousand years with the Sema as probably a primitive member of that lineage. And then alongside that evolution of the Neanderthals in Europe and Asia, our species was evolving in Africa. And we've got Jebel Ehud represented here as a possible early Homo sapiens fossil from Africa. And geneticists estimate that the common ancestor lived more than 500,000 years ago. Um, and there's a lot of now confusion, I think, disagreement about what that common ancestor was like. Uh, I think now I'm no longer sure. I used to think it was a species called Homo heidelbergensis that was the common ancestor. I no longer believe that. So I'm not sure who the common ancestor was and even where that common ancestor lived, whether that ancestor, common ancestor lived in Europe, in Asia or Africa. I don't think it's certain at the moment. So when we compare us with the Neanderthals through the whole skeleton, we can see there are certainly a number of differences. So on the left here, we've got a, a modern human skeleton compared with a reconstruction of a Neanderthal skeleton. And the Neanderthals are fully human, but they have distinct features from us. Their limb bones are strongly built, their muscle markings are strongly marked. 
they've got much wider pelvises, much wider uh, rib cages, indicating they have bigger lungs than us, for example. So there are differences in the skeleton, and those differences continue when we get to uh, the skulls. So we can see a Neanderthal skull at the top there, and an early modern human one at the bottom. And you can see there are differences in these. So Neanderthals have primitive features still in their skull, such as the strong brow ridge and a, a longer lower vault, even though the brain, brain is very large in there. Um, they don't show much of a chin. Um, modern humans have a more rounded uh, globular brain case and a, and a flatter middle of the face and a small or non-existent brow ridge. And Neanderthals have their own derived features as well. And some of them are marked on that skull in blue there, that projecting mid face and the great big nose pulled forward, um, the distinct ear bone shapes and the suprailiac fossa, a little depression at the back of the skull. Those are all derived features which mark uh, the Neanderthal lineage in its evolution. So modern humans having evolved in Africa, geneticists estimate that from about 60,000 years ago, there was a, a significant dispersal of, of Homo sapiens from Africa, expanding into Europe and Asia, and thus entering the territory of the Neanderthals. So these groups were destined to meet uh, after 60,000 years ago in Europe and Asia. And of course, that brings up the, uh, the always interesting question of interbreeding with the Neanderthals. So this has been discussed for, for many years. Uh, on the bottom right there, we've got a child skeleton represented from, from Portugal, uh, from Lagovelo, and that's been argued to be a, a hybrid of, of a Neanderthal and modern human. I think that's very unlikely. We don't have the DNA, but uh, that skeleton actually is only about 26,000 years old. So very unlikely at that late date to be a hybrid of Neanderthal and Homo sapiens. Um, I've known, we've known for many years that closely related mammal species can hybridize. So top, top left there, you can see that polar bears and brown bears uh, can hybridize and they produce fertile offspring. And this is true for jackals and wolves. It's true for um, many species of baboons in Africa. So closely related mammal species can hybridize successfully. So I always thought it was possible for Neanderthals, but until let's say the last 10 years, I thought that if it happened, it was not normal behavior, it wouldn't have been common behavior, and that was 40, 50,000 years ago. We'd never find any trace of it um, uh, today. Well, I was wrong about that. The DNA shows I was wrong about that. So this paper from Science in 2010 um, demonstrated pretty clearly that modern humans had Neanderthal DNA in their genomes. So as it says here, close encounters of the prehistoric kind the long awaited sequence of the Neanderthal genome suggests that modern humans and Neanderthals interbred tens of thousands of years ago, perhaps in the Middle East. As a result, and I'll change that to say most, pretty well everyone living outside of Africa has inherited a small but significant amount of DNA from these extinct humans. So all of us in, you know, we four have probably all got around 2% Neanderthal uh, DNA in our genomes from this ancient interbreeding. So that brings up the tricky question of are Neanderthals the same species as us? Uh, we may come on to that later, but I've written an article on the Natural History Museum website where I argue that yes, morphologically, because of their distinct pelvis shape, skull shape, ear bones, the Neanderthals and Homo sapiens are different enough to be regarded biologically as a different species. But that doesn't mean they couldn't have interbred because we know they did. And some of that Neanderthal DNA is still active in our bodies today. And so this is one paper of many written about this. And here we can see that, for example, type one balding, menopause age, sunburn, uh, false vital capacity, lung capacity, bone density, whether you're a morning or an evening person, your white blood cell count, all of these things can be related to bits of Neanderthal DNA in the genome. So that, that DNA is, some of it is still active in us today. And so we've got this evidence, and I'm sure Tom will probably come back to this later, and Becky too, probably, um, evidence of this interaction between uh, the last Neanderthals and the Homo sapiens coming into Europe and Asia. And here are some sites um, from, from recent studies which show evidence of interbreeding between Neanderthals and modern humans. And so finally, then, we get back to that big question of uh, 
you know, what happened to the Neanderthals? Uh, physically, they've disappeared. They've gone extinct, but not genetically. Uh, they, their DNA lives on in us today. And why, why did they disappear? Many different ideas. Here's just a selection uh, from the popular literature. Uh, Homo sapiens were to blame for Neanderthal extinction uh, because they were better hunters and outcompeted them uh, for food, a computer model shows. Bottom left there, climate change likely iced the Neanderthals out of existence. Strange that, because of course that would have affected modern humans too. Um, uh, on top right, uh, one of the more recent and I think more extreme ideas, uh, the end of the Neanderthals were linked to a flip of the Earth's magnetic poles, a study suggests. Well, this was a significant event about 42,000 years ago, but I don't think it, uh, it was what led to the extinction of the Neanderthals. Uh, at the bottom right there, Homo sapiens developed a new ecological niche that separated it from other hominins. Um, we have a unique ecological position as a global generalist specialist. And then in the center there, I think one of the nicer ideas, humans owe our evolutionary success to friendship. Cooperation was the key to our long-term survival. I think that's a nice idea. So yeah, I think our behavior was a big factor in our success. Maybe we networked and accumulated knowledge better learned to extract resources more intensively from the environment than other humans did, and above all found ways of improving the survival of our children and probably also the older members of our groups. As our numbers grew and we spread ever wider, perhaps we absorbed some of those other species out of existence. So yeah, just say thank you to, uh, thank you to all of you for listening uh, and to my other participants in this symposium and all the people who have supported my research. So. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. And thank you so much. That was wonderful. I think we all of the audience learned a great deal from that. And moving on to the next presentation, we have Dr. Haim coming up and we will allow him to begin. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's always, um, it's always a, both a pleasure and a challenge to, uh, to follow um, uh, up uh, with uh, Chris Stringer as your speaker before you, but I'll, I'll try and stick with what I know, and that is uh, dating. Radiocarbon dating is my area, as I said at the beginning. And radiocarbon dating is important because it's the method that's most accurate for dating archeological events in the past 50,000 years. Most people know a great deal about it, a little bit about it. The key thing, for dating in the Paleolithic, however, is that as radiocarbon decays over time, um, we have a situation where as we get back to the period that we're interested in, let's say between 30 to 50,000 years ago in radiocarbon terms, unfortunately, what happens is the amount of radiocarbon is very low. By 30,000 years ago, it's only 3% of what it was at, the, um, at, at yesterday. And by 50,000 years ago, it was only 1.1%. And that means that contamination plays a massive role in the ability of radiocarbon scientists to generate reliable dates. There are various types of contamination. Conservation materials are often used on human material to preserve it, and this can introduce carbon bearing contaminants. And in the archeological site itself, soil substances from humic acids, those are the decayed plant matter remnants, can also play a role in affecting the reliability of radiocarbon dating. So we've developed and applied a range of new methods to improve uh, radiocarbon dating in this period. One of these methods is ultrafiltration. It's a molecular method that allows us to separate small molecular components from the larger uh, collagen that we see here in the il il illustration. And we've shown that this is a, a, a much better way of removing contamination from ancient archeological bones and getting reliable dates for the first time. And this is crucial because many, um, much evidence has been obtained from the last Neanderthals in terms of direct radiocarbon dates and dates from archeological sites. Here's a review article from 2006, which shows some of the latest Neanderthal sites purportedly less than 30,000 years ago or between 30 to 35,000 years ago. And I've always been suspicious of some of these late dates. So I've been using methods like ultrafiltration to redate some of these key sites. And one of the sites you see at the bottom of Spain there in the previous illustration is from a site called Zafariah. It's a very important archeological site because it has the remains of some very well-preserved Neanderthals like this beautiful mandible. And radiocarbon dates of associated bones in the site have suggested that these Neanderthals are very late in age, between 29 and 33,000 years ago. Are they though? Well, we tested this uh, by redating some of these um, bones that have previously been dated so in our lab as it, as it happened. 
And the dates that were 33,000 years ago when we redated them using ultrafiltration, they came out at more than 45 to 46,000 years ago. Subsequently, even more data has been obtained from the site, which suggests that the Neanderthal remains themselves are way beyond 50,000 years ago. These previous dates were simply a problem of contamination. When we summarized all of the work we did over about a decade, we were able to put together a series of probability distributions which date to the latest period of the Neanderthals. And when we fit a Bayesian age model to this, we found that the age for Neanderthal disappearance was between 41 to 39,300 years ago. And this is the best estimate we have for the disappearance of Neanderthals in the area of Europe at the moment. Sometimes, however, radiocarbon dates, even of ultra-filtered collagen, produce dates that are um, still affected by contamination. So we've worked very hard in my group to develop even better methods for dating bone. And one of them is to use a single amino acid from a bone. And this is my, um, my colleague Thibaut Deviers working on the HPLC, as we call it, the high performance liquid chromatography system that we use to separate the amino acids from bone collagen. And by doing so, we're able to improve the dating still further. This relies on the me method called chromatography, which allows you to separate using a liquid and a solid phase it allows you to separate different analytes in a chemical mixture. And so um, at the bottom here, you can see that it revolves around a series of pumps and an HPLC column and an ultraviolet detector that allows us to separate all of the amino acids from the bone, uh, from bone collagen, and then select one, which in this case is a amino acid called hydroxyproline, which is the second one that you can see in this illustration. And hydroxyproline is, a, essentially a biomarker for mammalian collagen. So extracting it gives us a date for that bone like no other. And it allows us to remove all of the contaminants and get much more reliable dates. And so we've been using this method recently to date some of these other cases that yield late Neanderthals. The most um, prominent one would be, I think, Vindia cave. Here are two um, Neanderthal remains that have been dated uh, to between 28 and 29,000 years ago. And uh, when uh, we tried to redate these um, back in the mid 2000s, we used the ultrafiltration method first. And <laughs> we tried very hard to get um, a more improved dates on tiny amounts of bone that were remaining, bone collagen that were, was remaining. And you can see here that we got dates of around 32,000 years ago for these, uh, for these Neanderthal bones. A little bit older, but not much. And so we were very careful because we knew that there was still some remaining contamination in these bones to say that the Neanderthals of India were at least 32,000 years ago uh, old, but probably a little bit older. And I'm really glad that we said that because later when we applied the HPLC uh, approach, you can see here in green, the new dates that we obtained from hydroxyproline extracted from those collagen samples. And you can see that the dates here are more than 10,000 years older than they were prior to our, uh, our work, showing once again the, um, the, the extreme difficulties and the challenges of dating these um, types of samples. The, the reason that these dates were very difficult to um, uh, obtain reliable um, ages were from was to do with the museum conservation on the bones. At Kabazi in the Crimea, we find late surviving Neanderthals as well, or do we? Similarly to the Vindia case here, we have um, some radiocarbon dates that were obtained from bones from this very um, important series of sites at Kabazi in the Crimea. Kabazi II is one of the latest occurrences of the so-called mycokian industry, or is it? Here are the radiocarbon dates that were obtained from bones from that site, and you can see that they all fall at or after that date that I showed you at the beginning of 40,000 years ago for the disappearance of the Neanderthals. Again, we were suspicious of these dates, so we've redated the same samples, this time using ultrafiltration and single amino acids, hydroxyproline extraction dates. And what we found is very interesting. We found here in blue uh, on this uh, calibrated uh, series of calibrated dates, we find that all of the amino acid dates are beyond radiocarbons limits, beyond 50,000, and that therefore all of the previous dates are contaminated and completely unreliable. Um, another salutary lesson in thinking that bone dates that are reproducible are reliable. In this case, they're simply not. They're illusory and they are the effect of contaminants. Now, Chris mentioned the site of SPI. 
uh, this really crucially important site. Um, some of you may have um, noticed on the summary diagram that I showed you that SPI was one of the latest sites that we, uh, that we see here. Like uh, previously, the case with Vendia, the, um, the site of SPI was excavated a long time ago and the human remains have been kept in museums and they have been treated uh, a great deal with um, museum-based uh, consolidants. There are 89 hominid bones that have been uh, excavated in the 1880s and related to two individuals. And what's really exciting is that the collection has been poured over by Belgian and French uh, and other researchers who've identified many more uh, bone fragments from now three Neanderthals. And this is ongoing work. Um, there are more than 1800 hominid bone fragments now. But uh, the key thing about Spi is that some of these um, radiocarbon dates were um, quite young when they were first dated. So again, we've been redating some of these. This is a picture of a right deciduous incisor um, that uh, comes from the SPI collections. And uh, these are very challenging samples to date because of their extremely small size. Uh, this particular um, sample was previously uh, dated rather like some of the other uh, samples. And it gave, again, dates of 33,000 years ago. That's around 36, 37,000 years ago in calendar time. Uh, but when we extracted hydroxyproline from the collagen, we got a date that was much, much older, um, 41,700 years ago, which calibrates to around 44 to 45,000 years ago. So dating this final period of the Neanderthals is really difficult. It's very, very challenging because often the human bones that we want to date that are demonstrably Neanderthal have very high levels of contamination that derive from the care and attention that museum staff have put in to ensuring that they survive into the future. And this involves using conservatives to uh, treat them. So we now have to use much better chemical methods to extract uh, the material that we can um, date reliably, um, which excludes all of these conservation samples. And so for, uh, for, the, for the purpose of human material like this, we've shown that amino acid, single amino acid dating is the most reliable. And many of these sites, Zafariah, Spi, Vindia, and many others simply don't appear to be as late as they were once thought. So whilst we can show that Neanderthals disappear in Europe by 39 to 41,000 years ago, there's still more work to do to see whether in other regions this broader pattern holds. And I'd also like to acknowledge um, the work of a large team of people, um, particularly in my uh, former group at the University of Oxford and collaborators uh, elsewhere, and also the funding agencies that help to provide money to do uh, the scientific work that we, that, we, that we undertake. Thank you very much. And thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. I know a lot of people are very intrigued by radiocarbon dating and everything that it involves. And I'm sure this new understanding of it will help provide insights on how it works. And last Thanks, but uh... definitely, not least, we have Dr. Rebecca Rex Sykes, author of Kindred, and of course, not to mention Tom and his book, um, The World Before Us, and Chris and his many books, and I believe he showed off in his presentation. We come to Dr. Rex Sykes. How hey, are hello. you and your presentation? I'm good. I'm going to share. And How's that? Okay, good. Right, so I think actually it's really nice to have this like different talks and I should say we didn't like um, confer between us beforehand but I think it's actually worked really nicely and it demonstrates exactly what Neanderthal research is today that you need different focuses on different themes because that is how we work and um, we have enormous research teams of people who specialize in different stuff and um, so I'm quite glad because my talk doesn't really repeat a lot of what's been said and um, so hopefully this will work as like a, a part three <clears throat> so Chris was um talking a lot about um sort of the context of Neanderthals the evolutionary context and also stuff to do with um, anatomy and how we define them and um, so I wanted my talk to kind of be about the Neanderthals as living people um, and the archaeology of Neanderthals what do we know about what they did basically um, so that's kind of my perspective going sort of from from the dating and the evolutionary setting and the bones to the people um, and you know what can we say 
So we've had some maps already, <clears throat> but I wanted to show this just to underline what I think has been one of the really key and um, fascinating aspects of the way archaeology, uh, the archaeology of Neanderthals has developed in the past three decades or so, which is that they were not a monolithic entity. Um, you know, there, there are debates, as Chris was mentioning, about how we define them as a species, as a population, based on the interactions that we now know were happening for an awfully long time with us. Um, but looking at them um, on their own terms, um, we also really have kind of um, accepted now that, that the Neanderthal world was huge and they lived over this huge span of time and therefore actually we should expect to see some diversity within them. Um, and this has definitely been one of the areas where this is coming out. We can see it genetically, we can pick out subpopulations of Neanderthals, how they appear to be moving over periods of time and shifting to different regions um, between uh, Europe and much more into um, Western yeah. Eurasia. So that's fascinating. And there's going to be so much more, I think we find out about that. But also just looking at this geographic span, you know, this is from, from my book and I did focus on Western Europe more because I just know that literature better. And also there is a, a deeper research history there. So that's why there seem to be so many more sites. But in reality, you know, the whole of the rest of this map and potentially further east should also have more speckles of Neanderthals being there. And so this range of landscapes and geography is really important to keep in mind as something that um, under sort of underlays the diversity we see in the in the archaeology of Neanderthals. And as Chris said, we don't actually know where Neanderthals emerged. Um, it looks like maybe they were in Europe um, because we have the previous Asuma de los Huesos people, but we don't really know. So that's a really interesting point. Um, and yeah, so we looked at the chronology a bit and this image here is to basically show that Neanderthals um, sort of are emerging somewhere around here, 350, just after 400,000, something like that. And the red um, rectangles are basically the warmer period during which um, they lived. So they sort of disappearing. Uh, yeah, so there's 50,000 sort of about here. So while absolutely they did live during intensely cold glacial periods, um, they also, lived during times um, which were much warmer, as warm as today, and even warmer. Um, so just as much as we might imagine them on Step Tundra, um, this kind of landscape up here where you have musk ox and it's super, super intense Arctic conditions, they didn't really like that very much. That's not really now what we think was their preferred environment, much more Step Tundra grassland, even Mediterranean woodland, they're absolutely happily living there too. Um, so, you know, this idea of forests with huge trees, this is the Neanderthal world as well. And also I think something that comes out of the two talks before mine is the change in what we can do with the record now. Um, you know, Tom's talk is amazing because it's <laughs> slightly terrifying, you know, that, that all these, these different things we've, we've studied before and then you apply a new method and it's like, whoa, 20,000 years older. Um, we don't have quite that same issue with stone tools, um, but what we do have is the fact that many classic sites um, were excavated a long time ago and the standards of excavation and collection um, of artifacts are radically different today to what they were 100 years ago, 50 years ago, even 30 years ago. Um, the, the way we dig today is that we understand the sort of unbelievable richness of paleolithic sediments um we know that we don't just keep the, the the big nice looking stone tools we keep pretty much everything um everything is um zoomed in to, on 3d lasers um given sometimes in, in some sites you can see here like barcodes it all goes into massive databases the reason we do that is because as i say we now understand not only that there's loads of stuff in the deposits and loads of tiny things, but also you can be excavating a site and you have a layer 20 centimeters thick. You could go through that quite quick with your trowel, um, but that might actually have micro layers that you can't see as you dig it. And they only become visible once you plot out all those tens of thousands of objects later 
on your computer and you see the layers. So if you didn't record the spatial data, that would be gone. And that allows you to reconstruct the micro history of sites in a way that was impossible before we did this. So there is this interesting sort of parallel in the way that all these different methods in archeology span have been evolving. And that also includes things like digital refitting of stone cores, which has been really exciting for people like me who are into the stone tools. Um, and then, as I was saying, you know, like thinking about um, what do the sediments contain? You know, we've got so much better at looking for things like pollen, micro plant remains, um, loads of tiny stuff. This is a thin section of sediment, so a slice of sediment through a half, where you can see not only the layers of how that half was formed and used at different times at different temperatures, but you can do things like pick out pieces of bone that were burned at different temperatures in a midden, which tells you that stuff from different halves came there. So amazing stuff we can do. Um, and uh, also there is the DNA now that we can get from sediments, um, which is just mind boggling, like what that's gonna do for us as well. So methods are really transformed. That means that what we can say about Neanderthal life um, is just huge now. And you know, that was that was the intention when I wrote Kindred. I wanted to write um, not so much a book about how we do archaeology necessarily, although that's part of it. But, you know, what can we say? And it's just you know, it's, it's impossible to write a book about everything we know about Neanderthals. You just can't because there's so much of it. Um, so I, obviously in this talk, I can't do everything. But a, a good image of a change in, in what we know about Neanderthals is this one, which is from um, the book. It's drawn by Alison Atkin. And. Um, this is what we know Neanderthals ate in some places in some times. Um, you know, the variety of what they are um, consuming is just well beyond sort of older cliched ideas about, oh, they're just big game hunters and things like that. There is a whole history of changing ideas about what did Neanderthals eat as well, which is really fascinating in that it it ties into our perceptions of what Neanderthals are even capable of. Um, and, you know, perhaps that's something for, for the talks, uh, for the questions rather. Um, and also um, I love this image because um, I wanted to convey that there's not only diversity in what Neanderthals do with their stone tool culture, way beyond what we used to um, think, but also our understanding of um, their skill in working stone has really shifted and for some of the the um, techno complexes that we see and the the methods with which they reduced stone it's almost like you know conveyor belt efficiency um so this idea that they just all bashed stuff you know um so not going to go into that detail because this, as i say it's too much but in terms of just giving a picture in this really short talk about what I'm talking about with with diversity and, and how flexible they were um, is all the different materials that we know that they actually were using in their lives um, and this includes stone um, it includes um, shell as well so we can see them applying the same technological know-how between very different materials then we also have um, bone Bone working. There's not very much bone working if you compare it to uh, the Upper Paleolithic afterwards. But in terms of what we used to um, think, maybe they were up to, it's really quite um, sort of significant change in in how we're thinking about them. Bone is a really important part of their lives. They're using it every day actually for just making stone tools. But I'm talking about formal bone tools where they're actually shaped. So these we suspect um, are um, for working animal skins. A whole other realm of the organic world um, and materials Neanderthals were uh, using. And then we kind of come along here and there's the whole thing with plants now, the way that we can find evidence for what they're doing with plants, again, has just exploded um, because of the methods that we have now um, in some cases. Um, so we can see potential tools um, actually made from wood. And we have obviously, uh, this is a spear from Schöningen, which is, um, about 330,000 years ago. There's no actual Neanderthal remains from that site, but I think it's pretty likely it is uh, Neanderthals. Um, very finely worked. Uh, we have potential plant fiber technology, which is only one piece, but when you put it in the context of other things they're doing with plants, perhaps it's not quite so surprising. 
Um, I would like to see more work on that. We have a, a, a tiny scrap here, which seems to suggest um, that they were using oak bark to tan something. We assume that's going to be leather, animal skins. Um, and also, um, certainly not just with the technologies, but coming back to what Tom was kind of talking about, when we really zoom into the archaeo science, sort of the, the really impressive um, new methods they, they're using for dating, there's also something similar going on with the ability to identify animal, um, if not species, the groups of animals, uh, just from bone fragments. Um, and that's something that we can see with these pieces where connected to all of these different aspects of the, the, the material world Neanderthals are, are using, what we see, the same pattern that comes out of everything is that they are really, in general, very selective about what they use. They are hyper aware of the quality of materials um, and their material properties, um, whether that's stone or, or wood, for spears, the, the properties of it, how they work it. Um, and also we saw it in these um, objects where after analysis was done on those, it turns out that in um, uh, two of the contexts at least, they seem to be selecting not only the parts of the animals for these tools, which is ribs, but going for the big animals, bison or possibly aurochs, um, despite the majority of animals from that site they appear to be hunting being reindeer. So there's this impression that they, they're comfortable in the, the diverse materials that the world is offering to them wherever they live across that huge span of space. Um, and they are really, really selective. They know what they want to do and they are able to pick out the best quality um, of those resources. Um, and then we'll go, oh, why can't I click it? Let's try, there we are. Um, so if we move on a little bit to the other sort of realm of what an editor is doing with stuff um, in terms of their culture, um, as Chris showed in those sort of those headlines, you know, all the different sort of media headlines and stuff, a lot of that attention with Neanderthals always focuses on the question of what is their aesthetic capability, basically. Um, could did they make art? Did they talk to each other? Did they have language? Could they sing? You know, things like this. Um, and as an archaeologist, um, you know, I find the material evidence for this the most fascinating um but it, it's it's challenging but i really do think like the other slide that we showed in terms of the the variety of of objects and and different sorts of materials they were they were using something similar is going on with um the evidence we have for um their interest in materials that goes beyond just everyday survival there really is a lot of different examples of this now for the neanderthals Although, again, like with the bone tools, if you compare it to the later um, humans that came after them in, in, in Europe or elsewhere across the world, um, the amount of objects that look as if they may have some kind of symbolic or socially meaningful content, it's much less, but it is there and it's there across many materials as well. So we have a commonality in the use of um, pigments um, this is really fascinating. So material, mineral colours, basically, we can see them collecting stuff. Um, at some sites, there's a lot of it. At some sites, none or hardly any. But again, in, in cases where we can an analyse large groupings of it, it does look as if they're selecting for quality. Again, um, the mineral quality. Um, sometimes we're not sure if it's to do with for example, some black pigments, it can be for lighting fires. There's really cool experimental work that's shown that's a possibility. But in other cases, um, it doesn't really make much sense other than as a substance with which you are applying it to a surface. The question then is, why are you doing that? Of course, um, and that's where it gets tricky for archaeologists. You know, we can say, here is what the material is telling us about how this material how Neanderthals have interacted with this substance, but what are they doing with it? And that's the real key point. And that's when you get to really interesting objects like these, where you have two unusual things. So you've got pigments on what is a geode here. So a very unusual um, stone, uh, really, really heavy, would have been very distinctive and potentially brought if not from immediately outside the cave, at least um, locally. So that's from a, a Romanian site. Then you have 
um, cases from uh, Western Europe where you've got shells with pigment on them as well. And I find these really, really um, convincing as an argument that this is actually about aesthetics. It's about changing the appearance of things. It's about altering substances themselves. So this shell uh, from a Spanish site um, has a pigment mix on it um, different pigments from different places in the landscape mixed and put on the shell. Um, this is a shell that could have been from um, food waste. It's hard to tell with that one, but this one definitely not. This is an Italian site where there's a shell, which is actually a fossil, um, which comes itself from potentially about 100 kilometers away. So picked up, presumably from curiosity about the material. I mean, they would recognize shells. What's a shell doing? away from the sea in, in rock. Um, perhaps that's why it was picked up, but then what makes it extra um, important for this idea of aesthetics is that on the outside, there's red, red pigment applied, which itself came from 40 kilometers in a different direction. So this object is just really, really good because it brings together these different ideas about unusual substances and a wish to alter surfaces. And you see the same thing here. So this is a site from uh, Croatia, um, which already was interesting because there were a number of uh, talons from eagles from that site. Um, and then more recent work showed that once again, there is a pigment mix, tiny, tiny little piece of a pigment mix on that um, talon. So it's kind of, you're, you're sort of picking up that there are these different, um, very different places and times, but some of the things they're doing are kind of echoing each other. Um, and then also a different way of altering surfaces is by incising or carving. And this is a whole other range of things that we can see. Again, then they're, they're rare over the whole sort of corpus of, of Neanderthal archaeological record. You know, we have thousands more pieces of Neanderthals than we have of these sorts of objects. Um, but looked at individually, they are really, um, I think convincing in, in each individual case that things are going on. So this is a hyena bone with a series of lines and size, nothing to do with butchery. Um, and this is very recently published uh, last year, um, a giant deer toe bone around 51,000 years ago, I think um, from Germany, where you have a much more complex series of um, sort of scraping and, in, and engravings going on. Um, this is the most complicated um, sort of engraved object we have for Neanderthals now, even more than this one, I think, because it has more of a structure in terms of how that has actually been formed. So that's really interesting. I could go on about it for a whole hour. Um, the other realm that people always want to know about is Neanderthals and death, um, you know, because we regard it as something that's definitive about humans um, and different to animals, we believe, in terms of our conception of mortality. Um, but what does the material record tell us about this? Well, similar to, to the other aspects of their archaeology, what comes out today, I think, is that there is actually a variety of things going on. Um, there's been a focus for a very long time on did they bury their dead? Um, and to some extent, I think that question is actually... Also, the answer to that question is solidifying um, thanks to modern reanalysis of sites and new excavations. For example, this here, um, uh, new remains that are coming from a very old, well-known site, Shanidar in Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, and the answer is that in some times and places, it really does look as if whole bodies were deposited. Um, and importantly, in contexts where they were altering or sort of scraping out a hole or a pre-existing channel at, at uh, Shanidar. And so there is an interaction with the sediment to create a place for that body. That's not to say that's what goes on everywhere. Um, the other aspect to um, sort of mortuary interaction, as we would call it, is um, there's far more evidence now that Neanderthal bodies were being um, taken apart, butchered, um, and in some cases eaten, although the evidence for that's not always super strong, but in some cases pretty convincing, you've got tooth marks and things like this. Um, and also that parts of bodies are being then used as tools. So being brought back into active use and, and part of the Neanderthal's life. What all that means is really, really hard to say. And you will hear different ideas from different people. 
Um, for me, I like to keep an open mind about um, not trying to say that there is one explanation that fits everything. I'm certain that there's going to be different explanations in different contexts, particularly with the sort of the body deconstruction and cannibalism. You know, in some situations, this is potentially about starvation or violence, but I don't think that that is um, the end of the story with it purely because if we sort of look at the variety in human um, interaction with the dead across the, the, the world globally and through history, this way of interacting with bodies goes right back. And it's not always explicable in terms of violence, but also equally, if you look at our closest relations, chimpanzees and bonobos, um, this is also something that is really striking about them, that the body is the center of their means of dealing with emotional trauma when close relations or kin, uh, as in friends too, um, die. It's so obvious that they are intensely focused on bodies. So I think in that sense, we should expect something from Neanderthals like that. But then you also get interesting things where you have, uh, this is a French site with a piece of skull that's been used as, um, as I was mentioning, a piece of bone that you used to make stone tools with, but it's the only piece of skull used in that way from any species from any site it's actually not a really good piece to use for that purpose so is that because they are focusing on a skull and selecting it and they want to use it it's really hard to say um but then you have another really cool object here which is a skull again from crepina but a different layer to the eagle talons where you have a huge series of very fine incisions across the top of the skull which again are just not explicable as butchery or skinning something else is happening it's a marking of the surface it's a focus on the skull again but you know these are rare objects individually so putting all that together and making some argument for a skull cult is you know we can't do that that's that's just not um supported at all but there is an interesting sort of link back to what we see in Neanderthals sometimes being interested in creating series of incisions on other things especially bones um, so who knows to finish off um you know what's what's different <laughs> and we will come on to that with the questions um you know i think what's really clear to archaeologists and everybody who works on the antitals is that the the gap between us and them in so many of the aspects of their lives has shrunk a lot um you know, we can't say that they were rubbish hunters or that they never used pigment or, you know, all these different things. That doesn't mean that they're identical. And, you know, we can have theories about their behavior. But if we only look at the archaeological record so far, there do remain clear differences. So the engraved deer toe bone that I was talking about, that is still not as complex as the engravings we see from early Homo sapiens people in um, Africa that's actually older than that deer toe bone, sort of 80,000 um, years. This is on ostrich eggshell, incredibly complex repeated patterns, and this is on a piece of pigment um, here. Um, Neanderthals have an interest in shells sometimes, but we don't have sites where there's like zillions of shells with ochre um, with pigment on them, as we now see for early Homo sapiens 145,000 years ago. We don't have um, any uh, context where we have Neanderthal skeletons that are clearly buried with others, um, no multiple individuals. We don't have anything from Neanderthals where there's like loads of stuff in the grave with them. There's a couple of examples where we could argue, oh, it's a more complete bone than we see elsewhere in the site, like a deer jaw. We just, you know, that's interesting, but it's not a grave full of beads. So that's a difference. Um, again, we don't have any figurative um, representations um, of animals or, um, or certainly uh, well-associated handprints on cave walls for Neanderthals. And we have nothing like this um, 40,000 year old um, figurative uh, sculpture from Germany. So in the aesthetics and material realm, there are obvious differences, but there's also differences now coming out of, um, you know, work uh, from African context that there could well be um, significant differences in technology in terms of hunting methods, where we're looking at 
either very, very lightweight spears and darts um, or bow and arrow technology at least 80,000 years ago in Africa now. And we don't see that at all for Neanderthals. So there are differences. And if you try and pop all those together um, and put it with climate and put it with other aspects that we're going to talk about in terms of behaviour, um, then you can come up with lots of different ideas about ways that we may have had advantages over Neanderthals um, and things like this. But certainly the archaeology so far is clear that um, what we can see that Neanderthals were doing is vastly more impressive and complex than it used to be believed. But there does remain um, a clear uh, difference in all sorts of things. So that's the end. <laughs> All right, and that was absolutely great. And I think those three presentations really, again, surprisingly, since you guys didn't collaborate on them, went together so perfectly and really showed a good view of who and what the Neanderthals were. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna have a question and answer portion. And again, these questions were picked from you, the audience that were submitted during the period I was looking for them. And we've kind of gone over a little who will be answering what question, but I want to remind you all they're open to all three of you. And you can, of course, debate and discuss amongst yourselves. But we'll start off with what did the Neanderthal diet consist of? And did it cause them to have less dental disease? Uh, I can answer about the species and Chris could go with the dental stuff if you want. Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say primarily um, they, you know, they are hunter gatherers, absolutely. Um, and in whatever the climatic context or the kind of geography they're living in, um, large to medium species of animals, depending on what's available, is the basis for their diet. Um, so the idea that they are generally going after um the biggest animals that are around, whether that's red deer in a Mediterranean forest or woolly rhinoceros and the steppe tundra um, and mammoth, um, that's clear. But depending on when and where they live, we get an impression that where there is small game and it would make economic sense, um, for example, roe deer or boar in warmer woodland context, they will take that, beavers, things like this, but and rabbits as well. And birds but on the steppe tundra during the colder periods we don't see such a clear equivalent use of small game and um, for example they don't seem to hunt arctic hare there's no evidence for that that i know of at all um so that's quite interesting there is a difference there um and absolutely plants um and plants seem to be more focused on during the warmer periods when they're just more available so that makes sense there's lots of evidence for that from the archaeology you know from preserved pieces but also Toothware as well implies that. Um, and the question about marine resources and fish is really interesting because I get the impression that as they go around the landscape, if they're on the coast, they're perfectly happy to forage and use those resources. I don't think that we can say that they're actually diving for fish or anything because most of the species that are found can be washed up or you can access them at very low tide just by wading. But freshwater fish, really interesting, because that is not such an obvious signal, I don't think. Um, there's some sites where you can say, oh, there's some salmon bones and it doesn't look like animals could have brought those to the site. Or, you know, there are lots of different um, other kinds of uh, freshwater fish. Um, and again, there's no obvious animal agent bringing those in. But it's far less clear than the evidence for marine. Um, so I'd say overall that the diversity is quite impressive, but they do still focus on large to medium species. And in particular, they're not only just taking those, they are, like I said, with how they deal with materials, they home in on the best parts of those animals. They will sometimes be selective about the age of the animal, um, but they also, when they butcher, really focused on the fat and the marrow. Wonderful. I think that definitely answers that question. Now, I think Chris was going to say something about the dental right, do we, disease. Right, do we know how it affected their dental disease? Was it better or worse than what we know of today? Yeah. So interestingly, yeah, I mean, Neanderthals often show very heavy tooth wear. 
they show missing teeth, they show abscesses, but actually caries dental decay is, is rare in Neanderthals. It's rare in most early humans. So that is an interesting difference from more recent times. There's one standout example, not a Neanderthal, but the Broken Hill fossil, Cabway, uh, Homo heidelbergensis or Homo rhodesiensis, about 300,000 years old. That does show very severe tooth decay for whatever reason, but that is a standout. Most Neanderthals don't show uh, anything like uh, that level of, of dental decay of caries, yeah. To me, can okay. I say something on this uh, just briefly? I, I think um, we've had a, a really interesting last uh, decade or so with respect to not just Neanderthal diets, but di diets of upper Paleolithic humans as well. And I, I think, you know, we were really quite deceived in many respects because initially there was this big push on stable isotope analysis and stable isotope analysis of bones and teeth. And, and this only gave us part of the story. It gave us a lot of the story of the protein side of things. And Neanderthals were viewed as top end carnivores consistently, you know, as eating really meat, meat, meat all the time. We know that this is, you know, physiologically impossible. You can't just survive on meat. You have to eat other things. And so the last few years have seen a really um, a, a huge growth <laughs> in the analysis of, of, of other sources of evidence for, for, in this case, Neanderthal diet. And I think one of the most exciting things is, is the evidence that we find on plaque and in uh, and, and, and the teeth. And here we can now extract you know, evidence for actually actual molecules in the teeth dent in the teeth plaque, as well as uh, evidence for bacteria and parasites and, and, and DNA. And this is giving us a much fuller uh, picture of what these people were eating. And, and as Becky and Chris have both said, this now allows us to consider the plant world and what people were eating in terms of plants. So we get evidence for things like pistachios and water lilies and you know, wild collected plants that hitherto we have absolutely no idea about. So it's a very exciting time and we're really seeing a complete change in our interpretation of what Neanderthals ate in the past. Perfect. All right, now for the next question, and again, this is for all of you. Now, was there a pivotal moment say the sequencing of the Neanderthal genome by Svante Pablo and colleagues, which clearly demonstrated how human the Neanderthals were, or was it more of a question of ongoing research over the last 30 or so years that definitively led them to be more modern and correctly viewed as somewhere along our ancestors or cousins is the way it's put it. Uh, who's gonna start on that, Seth? You're gonna choose? Why don't we start with, why don't we start with you, Chris? <laughs> okay, well, yeah, I mean, I've always regarded the Neanderthals as human. And of course, here, it's an interesting discussion, what we mean by human. So for me, members of the genus Homo are all humans. So that's Neanderthals, Heidelbergensis, Antisessel. Those are all human. Um, in terms of being like us, as, as Tom and Becky have indicated, the gap has closed between uh, between us and Neanderthals. So, yeah, certainly more than twenty years ago, I would have argued there's a there's a significant behavioural gap between. There are a lot of things Neanderthals didn't do that modern humans do, and that gap has certainly closed. And those, you know, my first image was a number of papers which show evidence for why that gap is closing. And that gap closes in technology. It, 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 in terms of symbolic behavior, in terms of diet, um, in terms of stone tool technology, in terms of working bone and wood, um, that gap has really changed and narrowed right down. But I agree with Becky that there still are differences and we don't fully understand yet what those differences mean. The fact that Neanderthals apparently didn't do representational art to represent people and animals, is that again, just a gap in our knowledge and we're gonna find some. Or, or is that a real gap? And does it tell us something about Neanderthal cognition? Um, so yeah, there are interesting questions that remain, but I think, yeah, in terms of their whole bodies and their brain size, their behavior, they're fully human for me. Um, and, and you know, close to us in evolutionary terms, as we can see, we had a common ancestor with them, you know, within the last few hundred thousand years and we interbred with them. So yeah, they are close to us. Yeah. Um, maybe I can follow up on that. I agree completely. Um, so I, I think, yes, if you go back in, in, in time and you consider what people were writing about and arguing about, you know, in the 80s and 90s, then, you know, in the 90s, there was this big debate about acculturation. And acculturation was this idea 
that Neanderthals only began to adopt certain uh, of the kind of traits and behavioral activities that, that Homo sapiens were, were, were seemingly um, demonstrating at, at the time that they came into contact. So there was this big debate about, you know, the relative merits of these two different groups as they came into contact. And some people thought that they may not even have come into contact. So in that sense, the discovery of um, the genetic component to this was a really um, fantastic confirmation that there was indeed contact. Prior to that, there was a great deal of debate about it. One thing that we've found in, in our work is that, you know, and again, I, I'm, I'm biased on this because I always come back to aspects of chronology is that we, we, we for many years struggled to work out, you know, how, how, how much of an overlap there was between these various groups in different parts of Eurasia, and particularly referring here to Neanderthals and, and Homo sapiens, of course. And, um, you know, there were many people that thought that there wasn't a great deal of contact, if any, and because sometimes we find in these archeological sites in Europe that there's a sterile layer between the latest Mousterian and the earliest um, uh, Aurignacian, Proto-Aurignacian, or whatever the industry is that you're associating with Homo sapiens. Um, and what we now know through the genetics, through the dating, through you know, new, renewed archeological excavation and so on, is that there actually is a long period of overlap between these, these groups. And I would say at the moment, I mean, we published a paper in 2014, which suggested it was up to 5,000 years of overlap in different parts of Europe. That's now become about twice as long. And so you're opening up a whole new scenario there where you're looking at the exchange of genes and DNA and potentially also ideas and influence. So I think this is really exciting because it brings into play a whole lot of things that we can now start to think about, about what level of contact these groups had, how close they lived to one another, what influence they had upon each upon one another and so on. There are lots of very interesting cultural discussions that we can now have. Um, which seek to put into context the technological and behavioral developments that we see through this particular period. All right, great. And I think, you know, it is very important that we, we as a culture understand that Neanderthals weren't so drastically and completely different as they were such as that ape man that Chris showed off in his presentation. You know, we're not, they were not, or at least you know, as far as we know, they were not like that as evidence shows. And I think to sum this up, uh, we'll ask the most popular question that was asked by the most people. And I know this is something that I went over in my um, evolutionary behavioral class this last semester was, did Neanderthals have language? And if they did, was it something that we modern humans would consider comparable language? Or was it more nonverbal? Was it a proto language? What are your thoughts on this? Let's, Rebecca, do you have views on this? Yeah, I have views on everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what might make sense is if Chris talks about the anatomy and then I can talk about the archaeology because okay, I perfect. think that would be perfect. those are the two yeah. realms that, that are important. Mm. Yeah, so people have attempted to reconstruct the vocal tract of Neanderthals and there are different attempts at that. Some of them give the Neanderthals, you know, less vocal repertoire than us. Um, but as people have pointed out, many modern languages only use part of the vocal repertoire. So I think on its own, that wouldn't deny them language. Language for me is made in the brain. So that's, unfortunately, we can't get to the Neanderthal brain to find out what their language capabilities were. Um, but physically, yes, the vocal tract probably was a slightly different shape. It wasn't as, as deep-seated. So Neanderthals may have had high-pitched voices, for example. And there's a very funny video on a BBC site you can find of, uh, of an attempt to reconstruct how Neanderthals might have sounded. Um, they could have had high-pitched voices. Um, but yeah, I think we certainly can't deny them speech. I think their lives were complex enough that they must have had communication, speech, some kind of language maybe it wasn't as complex as ours maybe it didn't have concepts of deep time and abstractions uh, and the complexity of vocabulary that we have but i would still give them speech and language um, and yeah in, in terms of um, how we can look at this in the future i think uh, yes the amount of archaeology really the more we find out about the antile complexity the more we're going to be able to judge um, 
how they were communicating. And I think they were communicating with each other in, in human ways. Simpler language maybe, but yeah, I'd give them language. Yeah, I think <clears throat> one of the things that's been really striking for me in recent years in terms of the anatomical side is also the, the new work on their capacity to hear. Um, and that's very interesting in that the anatomy inside their ears that's that's preserved for only anatomy, um, although it's shaped differently, that looks as if it might actually just be to do with the, the different shape of, of their heads, um, their skulls. And when you model how it functions, it appears that the sound frequencies that their ears are tuned into best is very similar to ours and ours appear to be about listening to human speech. And this is a feature that um, even the uh, Cima de los Huesos uh, Neanderthal, uh, proto Neanderthals, um, they sort of, they're not exactly the same as the Neanderthals, they're slightly different again, but it, it points to vocal <laughs> communication being important in everyday life, not just for Neanderthals, but for our common ancestor with them as well. So that pushes it back beyond 500,000 that some kind of vocalizing is part of their lives and it's enough it's important enough that it's being you know focused on um evolutionarily um so i find that really uh quite convincing now the anatomical um side of it um and yeah i mean chris is mentioning you know like the complexity of what they do and you know there's two sides to the archaeology i think one is you look at the um the complicatedness of the skills that they have in the way that they use materials. So is that people often refer to stone tool napping. Some of the methods that are used, for example, Lavalois napping, um, which is about preparing the core and having in mind the products you want off that core. Um, is that so difficult and complicated that you cannot learn it purely by observation, but somebody has to actively teach you and explain those concepts about sort of the geometry and things like this. Um, for me, even more, um, sort of requiring of uh, potential active teaching is things like uh, uh, adhesive technology um, where you have to materially transform substances sometimes including mixes of adhesives um, and then that is a part of a material project where you're sticking together different pieces to make a composite tool that is a hugely complicated series of different skills knowledges about materials about the hierarchization of that process that this must be done in this order um, beyond anything that we see i think in animal technologies across um the world so that's one argument that some of the stuff they did was so complicated it needed language to pass that on between individuals then i think the archaeology also has something to say about um the structure of activity um, at a group level. Um, so Neanderthals hunting, for example, um, absolutely, I think nobody would argue now that, you know, they're not hunting in groups. Um, probably they are individually going off sometimes to grab a red deer or whatever, but for big, difficult species, I would think certainly that's, that's cooperative hunting. But lions and wolves hunt cooperatively. Um, does that mean Neanderthals planned their hunts using language? You know, that's a whole separate argument. And I think um, on the basis of what we know about the hunting and the, also for me as well, the way that their butchery is very systematic, it's not like a big scrum at a carcass. That whole process itself is systematic and orderly. <laughs> and then the, 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 the fat and the marrow is taken away sometimes to secondary processing sites before it then goes away to be taken to other people waiting for the different sites to be consumed. So there's that side. And then there's also the way that if you look at the structure of their sites where we believe they're actually spending time and living and sleeping, <coughs> paths are absolutely the spatial focus a lot of the time for that. We can see them sitting around paths doing stuff because we can see the material remains. That, as has been said um, many times before in these discussions, is a really potent setting for face-to-face -face communication to be very important um, rather than sort of just bodily communication where you're grooming and things like that, which is what we see in primates. So I think if you put all of those things together with the anatomy and the archaeology, um, 
I find it quite convincing. And also, we haven't really sort of talked about the interbreeding side of it, but not just the interbreeding, the potentials for what the social context for that was. Some of it might have been forced, you know, rape um, or sex involved in conflict, um, moving or, you know, sort of forced interaction of some kind. But some of it, I really do think we should assume some of it is actually curiosity between groups meeting. Um, and that's part of the curiosity. But even more than that, it's the hybrid babies that I find really interesting, that those individuals had to be able to adapt to the groups that they were then born in. Is that a mixed group? We have no evidence that's clear that says Neanderthals and Homo sapiens actually merged as groups and live together. We just don't have the evidence for that. Possibly it happened, but we can't see it. So I'm assuming that those interbreeding events were rarer and we're talking about babies that were then raised in the other group as it were but that happened in neanderthal groups and early homo sapiens groups so neanderthal uh, hybrid infants did definitely live and grow and develop within early homo sapiens groups could they have done that if they did not have a fundamental ability to communicate with some kind of language um I don't know. And those it, those those hybrids then went on to have their own children. Otherwise, we wouldn't see the genetic signal that we do see in the fossils and also in living people. So I find that really convincing, actually. Um, so when you put it all together, I think. Certainly some ability to communicate, some compatibility is there. But yes, you know, were they able to tell each other stories? Um, you can argue about that like based on well if they're planning ahead in time for hunting or if they have the complexity in terms of making composite tools where it's about different stages through time did that feed into symbolic understanding of time in language could you talk about what you did last week what you want to do in six months you know it's it's hard to say but i think there is a much stronger case than there used to be from all these different types of evidence um that um some kind of language is part of their lives as well as ours at that time all right well i think that definitely answers that question which i know is on so many people's minds and of course you did bring up and we brought up a little bit interbreeding which i think at this point we can all say occurred uh, we can set that in stone um and i think for this little get together, I think we're going to wrap it up. I want to thank the three of you again, Dr. Chris Tringer, Dr. Tom Hyam, and Dr. Rebecca Rag Sykes for coming on. The three of you have been utterly excellent and I could not have wished for this to go any better. I appreciate you all so much. And if there's anything you'd like to say, I'd like to give you that chance now, but otherwise we will say ta-ta for now. I want to say thanks to Seth for hosting um, and as always it's a pleasure to talk to Tom and Chris um, and yeah I just I hope we can all move forward and, and regard the Neanderthals on on their terms and sort of stop holding them up to standards that maybe are not quite fair. <laughs> yes yes I agree and as always it's a great pleasure again I echo what Becky just said to, to, to talk to my um, very uh, good colleagues and friends and also to you, Seth, and you're doing a great job in organizing this. It's great to bring people together, um, especially now in the present climate when it's so difficult to meet physically, to be able to bring people together and have to do these really interesting, hopefully interesting discussions um, <laughs> on the, um, in the virtual world is, um, is always uh, a welcome occurrence. So thanks very much for all your work. Yeah, uh, and thanks to me too, Seth, for organizing. Thanks to my fellow participants. And I know we didn't get through all the questions, Seth, so you're going to have to do this again, probably. <laughs> um, you know, in a, in a few months' time, no doubt there'll be a lot of new things to discuss. Definitely, definitely. All right, guys, thank you so much. And I will stop recording. <laughs>